Okay, welcome to Revelation chapter 9. We're going to break into this chapter. This chapter is pretty wild with uh, all kinds of creatures and fire and, and uh, smoke and all kinds of incredible things. So with that, let's open up in prayer. And I hope you all studied this out because um, there's some things in here that is even mind-boggling. Even mind-boggling to me as we look into this. So uh, let's open up in prayer. Father in heaven, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may you be blessed. May be praised. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for giving us wisdom, Lord. And I pray for your wisdom as we open up your word. I pray, Lord, you'll give us insight into Revelation chapter 9. And also um, that, you, that we will hear what your spirit is saying to the congregations, especially in these last days. Uh, Lord, may you be with us, Lord, and bless us and bless everyone who is participating in this study. And we thank you and we bless you, Lord, in the merit of Yeshua. Amen va amen. So uh, I linked on, on the video, I linked the full commentary as it stands so far, and it has like 120 um, pages already. So the whole thing is 120 pages. We only got down to nine. Uh, I'm trying to tell Lano where we're. Um, so, okay, so we're uh, going to begin. I want to tell you that this chapter begins hev uh, borrows heavily from Exodus, obviously, if you know the plague of the locusts is a big thing. Um, Joel one and two, and Jeremiah fifty one. Like if to read these, like to really look into them in a in a deeper level, uh, you have to know these chapters to understand Revelation chapter nine. So that'll be just Exodus, which is going to be Exodus chapter ten, which is talking about the locusts, and then um, Joel one and two and Jeremiah 51. Um, obviously, there's more prophecies here. You'll see things in, the, in other places as well, but these are, this is going to form the main uh, prophetic background blueprint for uh, Revelation chapter 9. So, I'll, speaking of that, I want to make a comment on Joel. So, Joel is going to form a big part of this, and I want to tell you that nobody really knows when Joel prophesied, and there's like three different opinions. And one of the opinions was that he prophesied during the time of Elisha. And, he pro and that was where Elisha prophesied that there would be a famine in the land for seven years, um, which is in 2 Kings 8.1. So um, Rashi says this famine is described at length in Joel, which is gonna gonna, going to undergird Revelation chapter 9 as we go through it. So let's get into it. Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. It says, The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from the sky which had fallen to the earth, and the key to the pit of the abyss was given to him. Okay, whoa, what are we even talking about here? Obviously, there's something spiritual going on. We know in Revelation, what does it say? The word abyss here is the word tehom. Tehom like we could write an entire book about this, like what this means, what it is. Uh, it's in Genesis chapter one. Uh, darkness is on the face of the deep, on the surface of the deep or whatever it says. Um, now it says a star fell from the sky and there's a debate, is this star an angelic? Obviously it's not a, a real physical star. We're dealing in symbolism here, but is this a holy angel or an evil angel? Well, to me the word fallen pretty much determines that this is going to be an evil angel just like Yeshua says in Luke 10 18 say when he says I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven that phrase fall seems to mean this person was cast down or this particular star was cast down and um, and is given the key to the abyss now I'm going to talk a little bit more about this um, let me actually go to the full Revelation commentary here. I think I added this from the book of Enoch, that there is a parallel. I think it's in 1st Enoch 88. Let me get down to Revelation 9, which uh, is, I don't know what page this is on, in, um, on paper. But in 1st Enoch 88, verse 1, it says, And I saw one of those four who had come forth first, and he seized that first star, which had fallen from heaven, 
and had bound it hand and foot and cast it into the abyss. Now that abyss was narrow and deep and horrible and dark. So that's First Enoch, um, eighty-eight, chapter eighty-eight. So in, in studying Revelation, has, has anybody here ever read Enoch, the book of Enoch? Sephira Hanok. Um, so what a fascinating book. You know there's not one book of Enoch, but there's three. So the first and second Enoch, which we have all three right here, but first and second Enoch are, first one I think is Greek, is, written, is preserved in Greek, and then the second one in Slavonic. And I think the third one is completely in Hebrew. And in Hebrew, it's called Sefer Aekalot, which means the, the book of heavenly palaces. And it is just a mind bender of a book. All three of them, they're really incredible. But here we see a direct parallel from First Enoch about the star falling down in connection to the abyss and what we're seeing in Revelation uh, chapter 9, verse 1, which tells me that this is not a holy angel, but he's given a mafteach, which is a key. Now... Remember in the previous chapter where there was a star, you know, the star falls and it's named Wormwood and it poisons all the waters. And we talked about its meaning in Chernobyl. We talked about other, other, um, other aspects. But listen to this. This is Beale, G.K. Beale. He says, on the star that falls in chapter 8, Beale writes, the identification of the star as Babylon's representative angel becomes more convincing as verse 10 is, a, is a, understood as alluding to Isaiah 14, 2, 15 through 28. There the judgment of the king of Babylon and his nation is said to occur because its guardian angel, the star of the morning, has fallen from heaven, thrust down to Sheol in the recesses of the pit. So last chapter we see the star fall. And if that's referring to Babylon, we're going to learn about more about the, the identity of Babylon. But when we are speaking about Babylon in the book of Revelation, I believe we're talking about Rome. Okay, we'll, we'll discuss the identity of Rome later. But on this particular one, it seems like there is, this could be some kind of representative of the east. So you have the west over here represented by Rome, and the east over here represented essentially by Ishmael, by the, the east, the kings of the east, which we're going to talk about um, later on. Okay, now notice that there are spiritual keys. I think this is fascinating. In Hebrew it says, mafteach um, be'er hateom, which is the key to the, to the, to the opening of the, of the bottomless pit or, or the, the abyss. In Tani 2a and b in the Talmud, there, there are different keys mentioned there, and that is the key of rain, the key of childbirth, the key of parnasa, which is financial blessing, and the key of the resurrection of the dead. Yeshua says he holds the key of David, which comes from Isaiah 22, verse 22, and he mentioned we talked about that in Revelation 3:7 and the key of death in Sheol in Revelation 1.18, as well as the keys of the kingdom in Matthew 16.19. So it, to me, it's just fascinating that there is such thing as a spiritual key and that these spiritual keys govern certain um, segments of, of existence. So I, I just find that to be interesting. Okay. This star that falls down who has this key, apparently this key was given to him. Remember when Pontius Pilate tells Yeshua, I have power over you to, give, to, to grant you life or death, and Yeshua says, you have no power over me except for that which is given to you from above. So on some level, it appears that this particular, this particular um, key, hey, how are you doing? Hey. This particular key uh, is given or somehow given to this particular star, which does appear to be a fallen angel, and he's going to unlock this, this opening of the abyss. Remember this, because this is going to set the stage for later on in Revelation chapter 9. All right, so <coughs> Revelation 9-2. So you're right on time here. <laughs> Revelation 9-2. He opened the pit of the abyss, and smoke went up out of the pit, like the smoke from a burning furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke from the pit. What does that sound like to you? It does. It sounds like a volcano, yeah. yeah. All right, I have a direct parallel. Genesis nineteen twenty-eight, And he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah 
and toward all the land of the plain, and he saw the smoke of the land went up as the smoke of a furnace. So Sodom and Gomorrah basically got hit by a nuke. All right. So if you know anything, we actually had an archaeologist come to beat the Derek, probably. Maybe even an asteroid. Could be an asteroid. Could be an asteroid. We had an archaeologist come to to Beta Derek, uh, I don't know, it was over 10 years ago. It was when we were still in the old building. And he brought all these, like, archaeological artifacts, and he says that they, he was excavating what he believed was the site of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they found trinitite there, um, which is something you only really find at, uh, you know, the Trinity blast site where Oppenheimer and all those guys blew up a nuke. What was the name of it? Trinitite. Is it a new element that was formed from the molecule? It's not a new element, but it's like a it's like a geological when it's subju subjected to just insane amounts of he heat, it um, mm. it congeals or something. I don't I don't know exactly the science of it, but um, which I find that pretty remarkable. Listen to this from Menachot 99b and 100a. It says he has allured you or directed you away from the narrow opening i.e. from Gehenna. So Gehenna is the way you say hell in um, rabbinic literature. It's actually in the New Testament as well. The word hell is the name of a, Bab of a I think it's a Norse goddess of the underworld. So if we really want to understand the concepts of heaven and hell, you have to eliminate those two words, okay? One, if you really want to understand heaven and hell, you must eliminate the words, at least eliminate the word hell, okay? Um, the correct term here is Gay Hinnom. Gay Hinnom means the Valley of Hinnom. So we're going to talk a little bit about this because I heard a, a preacher say in this particular chapter, literally all hell breaks loose. Um, and it does. Okay. Well, it's kind of fascinating that that Dead Sea area where Sodom and Gomorrah was is like today, 1,400 people at <coughs> sea level. But that's a huge, uh, well, it's a part of the Great African Rift, the Rift Valley. Uh, that's a fault line, a monstrous fault There is a fault line there, absolutely. Um, absolutely. One of the problems with the Dead Sea getting so low, I don't, I don't know if the theories actually sound anymore, but they used to say that they think the Dead Sea is in some way stabilizing that fault line. Uh, I, I haven't studied that very much, but I have looked at USG, uh, or the, you know, the U.S. Geological Survey, and they have maps of all, the entire world I was researching fault lines in Israel in preparation for Revelation 11, um, and uh, there are some serious fault lines there. Yeah, and the Dead Sea is that. that Dead Sea valley. is the the Jordan Rift Valley. The Jordan, right. The Jordan Rift Valley is the a massive sea of fault. Galilee is 600 feet below sea level. Yeah, so there's something amazing going to happen there. But we see that there's a link because of the language used in Gezer Shava. Gezer Shava is this. When you have an estate, when you have a statement in scripture that uses a particular phrase, and you see another scripture use that exact phrase, Gezerah Shava literally means equivalent judgments. And so when you see it over here and you see it over here, these two verses are linked together, even if they're if even if they're not linked in any other way, even if there's no connection that appears there. Um, when you see that there is equivalent statements, what you are seeing that these two passages are actually commenting on each other. And so they're like everything's linked. So, speaking of Gehenna, it says the opening of which is narrow so that its smoke is collected within it. And lest you say, just as the opening of Gehenna is narrow, so to all of Gehenna is narrow, the verse states, for Gehenna has been arranged of old and is prepared even for the, for the king, deep and large, its pile is fire and much wood, and the breath of the Lord kindles it like a steam, stream of brimstone, Isaiah 30, verse 33. So, I don't know exactly what this to home that they're unlocking is, but there are parallels between it and Gehenna. Um, so we're also going to talk about the seven names of Gehenna. We know that there are seven names of heaven in Scripture, which we call it um, Aravot, Maon, Zevul, all the different passages what we talked about earlier. There are also seven compartments in Gehenna, according to rabbinic text. I also <laughs> believe it's in, in the book of Enoch, and we're going to explore that just a little bit. Um, now listen to this. This is Joel 2.10. Uh, speaking about the sun and the air were darkened, it says, Before them, before this locust army in Joel, 
heaven shakes and the sun and the moon are darkened and the stars withdraw their brightness. So we see a direct parallel between Joel and Joel's going to mention this army of locusts, which we're going to talk about in just a little bit. Steinsaltz, Rabbi Steinsaltz comments on this and he says, when millions of locusts flew in mass, the sun and the moon were darkened and the stars withdrew their shining as though locusts gathered in the light of the heavenly bodies or removed their light. The swarm of locusts is similar to a thick cloud of darkness that arrives from afar and blots out the daylight. Now, um, I have never seen a real locust plague. I don't know if they have that stuff in West Texas or not, but in the Middle East, locust plagues are really serious. India, India has that? Oh, wow. That, India has locust plagues? Oh, where in India are you from? The Himalayan mountain? Is that near Gujarat? Uh, oh, wow. Oh, so, so you're not from the Gujarat area? Oh, okay. I know some Gujarati. Uh, I was going to try to practice on my, uh, my Indian. Um, hey, in the Middle East, I mean, the midsection of our country, they've had locust plates too, and the descriptions were just like that, that for a couple of days you couldn't see the sun. Well, it was yeah. so dark. So I want to tell you, in 19, I think it was 1918, there was a massive locust plague in Israel. And um, it was so big that the Library of Congress, the U.S. Library of Congress, you can look this up, they took photos before and after. It stripped every green thing bare completely. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. government says this was a plague of biblical proportions. That's their language. And I want to tell you that every time... Um, Every time any person other than the Jewish people start taking root in the land of Israel, something shocking has happened in the last 2,000 years. All right, so uh, there have been plagues bro bro uh, break out. There are earthquakes break out. There are massive locust plagues. Like I said, 1918, this massive locust plague is something of the history books that happened. And basically it kept the slate clean so that the population wouldn't be so high where the United Nations would not have agreed to give the land of Israel to the Jewish people, to the point that uh, even like uh, Mark Twain, he wrote in Innocence Abroad, he goes, we barely saw anybody, nobody was here. This whole place was desolate, which is written in the book of Leviticus, that if Israel does not keep the Torah, God will make the whole land a desolation. And Rashi comments that to such a point that even our enemies will not be able to derive satisfaction from it and that is a blessing actually for Israel. Um, so this has literally happened in our own days. There was about two, three, maybe three years ago, a massive locust plague in Iran. And, um, and this is serious. Like the, the, they can destroy entire crops and it's, it's really shocking. How many Jewish people, like what's the population in Iran? In Iran today, um, I've seen those numbers and it's super low. But it, it, in like in Algeria and in um, uh, Libya, there's like three Jews. You know, Afghanistan, there's still one Jewish guy there. He's, he's wow. the last wow. Jew in Afghanistan. They made a documentary on him. He's like the last guy who refuses to leave. Um, but they were expelled. If you know, the Jewish people were expelled out of Arab lands uh, after 1947. They, and they, had, they were forced, uh, which is... I think it was 600,000. Uh, I think roughly 600,000 sounds right to me as well. But there was tons of Jewish people in Arab lands, and they were all kicked out after, uh, after 50, 47, and they went to Israel. Okay, Revelation 9.3. And then out of the smoke came forth locusts on the earth, and the power was given to them as scorpions of the earth have power. This is where it gets really unusual because we're reading something that appears to be completely symbolic. Um, and we're kind of <clears throat> going to go into that. So Exodus 10 says, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, even all that the hail has left. And the locusts went up over the land of Egypt and rested in all the borders of Egypt. They were very grievous. Before them there was no locusts such as they, nor will there ever be again. Hmm. So... I read several commentaries with the rabbis on this that they said, nor will there ever be again. It appears that Joel is contradicting this from Exodus, but the difference here was that there was essentially a single 
uh, locust species that attacked. And there was, there was, it mentions a few other of them, but they were like secondary. Whereas this last locust plague, there are four different types of locust. And the Hebrew gives the four different species of these locusts. Anytime you see four different levels attacking Israel, you should always think Babylon, uh, Media Persia, Greece, Rome. And that's what this is. Okay? So the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the four, it's the golden head, silver chest, was it the bronze legs and the um, the clay and clay and iron? So it's it's from Daniel two the, that statue. So the rabbis linked it to that, and that's going to give us a key to understand the locust. Now, I was reading. Let me see if I have it here. If this is it, this is Jeremiah. Um, I was reading this. I was like, man, I want to know the secret of these locusts because you read it in the book of Revelation. This has got to be one of the most mystifying chapters when you're looking at this. And I don't claim to 100% know exactly what we're talking about when, it, when we're identifying the nature and the identity of these locusts, but they're obviously quoting Joel too. So remember our pattern. What we do, we find the source text in the New Testament in the Tanakh. So if the New Testament is talking about these, these locusts that look like horses and scorpion tails and all these things, we look for that in the Tanakh. We find it in the Tanakh. We find the rabbinic commentary of that on the Tanakh and then forward apply that to the New Testament. Therefore, we have a rabbinic commentary in the New Testament. When you do that, you unlock almost everything. And no, obviously there's still some mysteries there, but uh, with that said, um, it's... Uh, it's very interesting. So I was looking at Joel, the, the commentary here, and so here is Joel 2. It says, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of densest cloud spread like soot over the hills, a vast, enormous horde. Nothing like it has ever happened, and it shall never happen again through the years and the ages. So it's obviously quoting Exodus, but there is something on a different scale. So as I understand it, when you have, the Exodus provides a, a prophetic blueprint for the final redemption, right? And that's according to the principle, Ma'aseh Avot Siman Lebanim, the actions of the Father serve as a prophetic blueprint for the children. So when you're reading about this, this one species won't be able to do the same level it did in, in Egypt, but now we have four different species. So it's like apples and oranges in comparison, even though the, the last curse is this fine, it's this echo of the original uh, Exodus. So Rashi on Joel 2 says, the increasing locusts and the shearing locusts are spread over the mountains as the dawn is spread over the entire world. So I think what happens, and I think we talked about this already, what happens locally in Egypt is now on a global scale. Okay, so now listen to this. In Ezekiel 2.6, it says, You, son of man, do not be afraid of them. Neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns are with you, and you dwell among scorpions. Do not be afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, for though they are a rebellious house. So we see that people are compared to scorpions in the book of Ezekiel, which I'm, this will go somewhere in just a second. Now listen to this. Judges 6.4. They encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth until you come to Gaza. They left no sustenance in Israel, no sheep, ox, or, dog, or donkey. For they came up with their livestock in their tents. They came in as locusts for a multitude. Speaking of, of different armies are coming in and they're likening them to locusts. Both they and their camels were without number and they came to the land to destroy it. Israel was brought very low because of Midian. Speaking of a Midianite army. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like locusts for the multitude, and their camels were without number, and the sand which is on the seashore for the multitude. I find that to be significant because we're talking about Midianites, Amalekites, and children of the east. That's a very interesting term. Um, who are we talking about? Children of the east. Uh, Abraham's sons? So that does, it reminds me of Keturah. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of Keturah's sons, 
that she had, and you know some people actually think that Keturah had sons and she sent them away and gave them gifts and sent them away, and that actually went into, uh, it's a conspiracy theory. It's, I don't think it's really true, but that her sons came and went into India and they brought some some deeper understanding of Judaism, which eventually became literalized in India. And I've studied uh, Hinduism and the various things, and you do see fragments of truth where, and you think it, it seems pretty plausible on some level, Abraham, you know, there's there's a lot there, but in any case, I think that uh, some people have, have dis, uh, disproved it. So, okay, long story, if it is, who is east? Okay, east of Midian, which is in uh, modern day Jordan, South Jordan and Northern Saudi Arabia. You have Iraq, you have Iran, you have Pakistan, you have India, you have China. Okay, so this is, these, these are, the, and remember we're thinking on a global scale here. One thing I'm very proud of India, by the way, they are so pro-Israel. In, uh, I don't know. They're very, they've been very pro-Israel. Like all the people have been standing up for Israel in an amazing way. Um, Israel has been partners good friends. for a while. Yeah. Mm. Also, I think India and China don't really like each other because they're both on the border. And also India and Pakistan really don't like each other because of the Kashmir issue. Um, I don't know. I'm not, exact, I'm not an expert in that part of the world, but Okay, let's go. Uh, Revelation chapter 9, 4. Yeah, we got an expert in that part of the world. Okay, uh, Revelation 9, 4. They were told that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only those who do not have God's seal on their foreheads. We talked about it, uh, I think it was last week or the week before. God's seal is truth right the seal of god is truth that's what the the bible says and it also appears that it's his name yudhe vavhe right um but notice this here's keener he says ordinary locusts would have feasted on the vegetation and left the people alone right. you see this complete inversion yeah so whatever we're talking about it ain't regular locusts right. all right yeah. so we establish that fact I think it'll become super obvious when we talk about scorpion tails and shooting fire and doing all kinds of things. But whatever this is, it's not normal locusts, and they are emerging like a uh, with, out of the pit of, of the abyss onto the earth after being unlocked by a fallen angel. And um, so we're seeing something very unusual here. Okay. Revelation 9.5. They were given the power not to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a person. Okay, we get a very unusual. Why does it say five minutes specifically? What do y'all think about that? I was trying to figure that one out. I'm like, well, the spring feast is a fall feast. That's longer than five months. Maybe it's like Hanukkah to Purim, or I don't know. I couldn't figure out the five. Yeah, well, there's something about curious. the five months. So this is what I found. I don't know if this is legit. In Genesis 7, 24, the waters flooded the earth for 150 days. So 30 times 5 is 150, roughly that same time. Um, some have noted that the lifespan of a locust is about five months. Could mean something. I have no idea. One thing I think about this, though, is that this gives us a key. Whenever this actually does happen, um, you know, you can actually match it up and say, hey, this, when you see this thing, it's probably going to be five months. This seemed to be some kind of plague, some kind of affliction. Um, now, like the torment of a scorpion, a scorpion's tail contains venom and it repeatedly stings its, its victim. Uh, it doesn't just, did you get bit by a scorpion before? Yes. Oh, was it, was it one sting or? <laughs> oh man here yeah oh no and and so midland odessa does have scorpions but probably not like the india has what do you got up there like <laughs> oh man that's one thing i like whenever i think of india i've never been to india but i think of like indiana jones so like i'm thinking like <laughs> the temple of doom cobras, uh, cobras 
Yeah, we got we got um, rattlesnakes here, but the scorpions here, I think they just hurt. I don't, unless somebody's allergic. And your arm goes numb, and then your tongue and mouth goes numb. Your arm and your tongue and mouth went numb. Yeah. Okay, wow. The venom and food your yeah, yeah. Oh, man. So I didn't know that. I didn't even know that that was possible around here. Well, I, I learned that, um, so scorpion stings are a public health problem, particularly in the tropical and subtropical regions of the Americas, North Africa, Middle East, and India. About 1.5 million scorpion envenomations occur each year with around 2,600 deaths. So I, I didn't think it was that. This is just uh, Middle East, India, North Africa, and the Americas. But in Mexico, they have some, like, really some crazy bad. version. These guys here, I think they just sting you. But Okay, so here's something I'm just kind of thinking about. Um, maybe because of the Facebooks, or no, because of the sensors online. Maybe we don't talk too much about it. But you know the stinger of a, of a, um, of a scorpion? It's got some kind of metal in it. It's like, it's called metalla, metallo something, metalloprotein or something like that. And it's called a hypodermic uh, stinger, basically, I guess. Um, so, okay, long story, that's just something to, to think about. Um, Revelation 9, 6, in those days people will seek death and they will in no way find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. So death will flee. This is referenced in multiple texts, Revelation 6.6, 6, Jeremiah 8.3, Hosea 10.8. Just this concept that people will be in such pain that they would want to die, but they're unable to, and apparently unwilling to commit suicide. Uh, so on some level, they're under great pain, but not to the point that... Um, that they would go that far. Now, it does appear that during the locust plagues that maybe there were some Egyptians died during that time, mm -hmm. possibly. Um, so, Revelation 9-7, kind of moving fast through this. Mm -hmm. The shapes of the locusts were like horses mm -hmm. prepared for war. On their heads were something like golden crowns and their faces were like people's faces. Now that is so wild. I tried to get like an AI image generator to mm -hmm. make this. So I said, hey, make this and hit enter and it just, it, it could not do it. I can't even visualize really what this would look like. I've seen a couple of graphics that look terrible. Um, this is kind of disturbing when you see this, but let's look at Joel chapter two, verse four. Let's, let's, let's just go to Joel. Actually, let's just go to Joel 1 real quick. So if we go to Joel 1, I think we're going to, um, we're going to see uh, lots of parallels. And when you see a reference like this in, uh, in the text of the Bible, you need to go back and not just read the one verse, but read the whole thing. Okay. So I'm going to skip through this really quick. But the book of Joel, it says, The word of Hashem which came to Yoel, the son of Petuel. Hear this, O elders, and give ear, O inhabitants of the land. Was there such a thing in your days or in the days of your forefathers? Tell your children about it and your children to their children and their children to another generation. Now, I want you to see that the rabbis say because of this that this is going to happen in the last days. That's why he wants to he wants to remind all the children and future generations about this locust plague that's coming in the last days. It says, what remained from the cutting locust, the abundant locust is devoured. What the abundant locust, the chewing locust is devoured. What remained from the chewing locust, the demolishing locust had devoured. These are the four different um, species of locust in this particular text, all right? So, it says, for a nation has come up against my land, mighty and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of a lion, and it has molars of a lion cub. And Joel 2.4 says they, which I skipped, they say, <clears throat> um, was it 2.3? The gnawing, gnawing locust. I have it here where it says they have the appearance of horses. Maybe I'll put the wrong uh, reference here, but 
it references that these locusts have the appearance of horses. Yes. And uh, verse 4. <coughs> um, okay. So uh, I'm just looking to see where it says it. Okay, so Rashi commenting on this says they have the appearance of horses in their running. In other words, that they don't really look like horses. They appear like horses because of the way they're rushing. And that helps with the visual aspect of what we're dealing with is that um, when you have a ton of ton of army rushing towards like a, like you've seen those, I don't know, movies like, uh, was it like Braveheart or whatever, there's just like a ton of horses running out that they look like horses, not in their, so much their physical appearance, but in their the way they're moving. But Steinsaltz says, uh, Rabbi Steinsaltz says this, he says, their appearance is the appearance of horses. Indeed, the shape of a locust head in the back resemble that of the horse. And it does, it's kind of face is kind of elongated. And the stampede of horsemen that is men on horseback, so they run, they charge forward in that same manner. I guess the more I read this and try to put it in a modern context, in the description of this, I, I mean, pardon the conspiracy theory again, but it sounds like an attack helicopter. Okay, we're going to talk about that. We're actually going to mention that exact thing. So in Revelation 9.8, it says they had hair like women's hair and their teeth were like those of lions. All right, so we just now read the teeth were just like those of lions. And um, I somehow lost where it says that they look like horses as well, but um, it is in the text somewhere. I just don't, I don't know the exact uh, verse. So Revelation 9.8, they had... Oh, verse 7? Verse 7. Verse 7, I put verse 4, so I need to... Yeah, so you see that, um, I'm looking to see where this is at. Uh, so I don't really like this translation, I guess. Um, so you see that uh, these things look like horses in the way they move, but also the general shape of one kind of looks like a horse. They're coming at, at with, with um, like a massive army. So they had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like those of lions. This type of visual is kind of scary sounding. Um, and the the women's the, the women's hair uh, the women's hair thing sounds sounds really uh, it makes it. Is it drag queen? It's, it's like <laughs> that's hilarious. That's hilarious. But it, it's it sounds it even makes it more scary because if you take something that it, that has like a an alluring quality to it and ascribe it to something that's so horrifying, mm -hmm. it makes it even scarier in a sense, okay? So. Or is he meaning like long and flowing? Like so, rotors of a helicopter? I've looked into this, and this is a very unusual verse. Mm -hmm. We have found a parallel for it. Okay, so here's a parallel. Listen to this parallel. This is from a text called the Apocalypse of Zephaniah. Zephaniah. I want you to hear this. It says, in that same instant, I stood up and I saw a great angel before me. His hair was spread out like that of a lioness. His teeth were outside his mouth like a bear. His hair was spread out like a woman's. His body was like a serpent's when he wished to swallow me. And when I saw him, I was afraid of him so that all the parts of my body were loosened and I fell on my face and I was unable to stand. I prayed before the Lord Almighty. You will save me from this distress. You are the one who saved Israel from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. You saved Shoshana from the, elder, from the hands of the elders of injustice. That story is in the Apocrypha. You saved the three holy men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Uh, um, from the, burn, from the furnace of the burning fire, I beg you to save me from this distress. Then I, then I arose and I stood and I saw a great angel standing before me with his face shining like the rays of the sun in its glory, since his faith, face is like that which is perfected in beauty. And he was girded as if a girding, golden girdle or a sash was upon his breast, and his feet were bronze, at which, were, which is melted in fire. And when I saw him, I rejoiced, for I thought it was the Lord God Almighty, or I thought it was the Lord Almighty who had come to visit me. I fell upon my face, and I worshipped him. He said to me, Take heed, do not worship me. I am not the Lord Almighty, but I am the great angel, Eremiel, 
who is over the abyss, and Sheol, the one in which all of the souls are imprisoned from the end of the flood, which came to earth until this day. Then I inquired of the angel, what is this place to where I have come? And he told me, it is Sheol. And I asked him, who is the great angel who stands thus whom I saw, the one that was all splayed out with hair? He says, this is the one who accuses men in the presence of the Lord. So I still really kind of don't know what to make of that, other than this is kind of a really freaky picture of this lion-like, angelic, demonic beast with like hair shooting everywhere um what did he say the body was a serpent like a serpent and like a lion and all of it mixed all together so i think this is part of this daniel tradition also where you have this chimeric like an animal where you have like okay like a centaur or like a like a what's another one a griffin or something like that where you have these these uh, creatures that are representing something and each one of the elements of the creatures represent a particular characteristic about their spiritual um, nature. Okay, Joel uh, 1.3, which I read, it says, what the great lo locust is left, the grasshopper is eaten, what the grasshopper is left, the caterpillar is eaten. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, and for it is cut off from your mouth, for a nation has come up against my land strong and without number his teeth are the teeth of the lion and he has the fangs of a lioness so do you see what joel is referring to apparently joel is referring to um actual locust but it seems to be a picture or, or or a prophecy about an invasion potentially of babylon and ultimately of rome the abarbanel rabbi don yitzhak abarbanel says that this entire prophecy concerning the swarms of locusts is actually a parable for invading armies which are destined to conquer the Holy Land. The prophet exhorts his listeners to remember this prophecy and relate it to future generations because it accurately describes the fate, the future fate of the Jewish nation. So when you're reading about this, on one level, you see that it's clearly demonic. This is not normal locust, but on some level, it appears if we take the abarbanel as the as the commentary, we are seeing this as a picture of an invading army that's going to come up, up against Israel, which is going to go into the next part. And then this invading army um, cannot touch the man who had the seal of God on him. That's right. Well, that well that. That, that complicates it because that's also a spiritual angle there. So it appears like if this is a physical army, they're puppeteered by the spiritual locust in a sense. But if it's referring to, um, it, it, it's a kind of a mysterious tax. So I really don't know how to, how to parse that out other than to say that it's pretty difficult to say uh, you, have, you have these locusts, which in the Tanakh do refer to physical locusts and it does refer to physical armies. In this particular case, it probably refers to physical armies that are being empowered in by spiritual armies, negative spiritual armies. So when you see this war happening on earth, you're seeing a war happening in heaven at the same time. So I think what's happening on earth is a reflection of what's happening in heaven and vice versa. Well, every time that Israel has a war, especially the 48 war and the Hamas war right now, there's there are always stories that come out. The Six Day War. Yes, the that's Nazi right. War, war stories come out where you, you'd have to call it angels are encountered they, mm -hmm. by the enemy. The, the spiritual realm is is involved in this physical war. It's a physical war, but they always have supernatural things happening. The spiritual realm is always involved in these physical things. What in, in the stories I've heard coming out of these. So that's worth exploring. This this idea, and I think your idea is the solution because when we're seeing something physical, it has a spiritual component to it that is very important, which we talked about in Daniel, where Daniel uh, is praying for three weeks and then finally unlocks this uh, locks the other angel to to help the one fighting against the prince of Persia. 
So as I understand it, before you defeat a nation, you have to neutralize the spiritual prince that is over that nation. We talked about it in previous weeks where there are 70 spiritual princes over the different nations of the world. There are 70 nations in the world uh, from Genesis chapter 10. And over the earth, there are these 70 nations. Obviously, the prince of Persia, which is the prince of Iran, is one of those nations. In order to neutralize the Iran of today, you have to neutralize its spiritual prince. You can't beat Iran with physical weapons. You have to beat them first with spiritual weapons and spiritual warfare and spiritual armor, and then you can neutralize the, the government. Not the people. The people of Iran are wonderful, amazing, incredible people that are um, oppressed. They're oppressed. Yeah, but they're, uh, Iranian people are incredible. Um, but with that said, their government is obviously completely bonkers. Um, some could say our government's bonkers too, but uh, yeah, a lot of, everyone's going bonkers. All right, so, uh, so that tells us something. And it's very important for us to understand this. And I heard this, from, I heard this teaching from a rabbi. If you want to neutralize a dome, and y'all know what we, mean, what we mean by a dome. You have to be more righteous than a dome. If you want to neutralize Ishmael, you have to be more righteous than Ishmael. And obviously, a dome means Roman, you know, the Roman religion. And Ishmael means the Islamic religion, okay? You have to be more dedicated to Hashem than they are dedicated to their particular Gods. And when they give alms, let's say in, in Islam, there's five pillars, right? And one of them is give alms, give money to the poor. That is a holy action. And when a, when a person does a holy action, they gain a spiritual armor. So you get a spiritual armor. So, for instance, Rome is very much against abortion, and they're very, like, pro-life. Okay, they're one of the biggest voices of pro-life. That gives a spiritual armor, and that's a holy thing. Um, so if you really want to neutralize an R, uh, uh, a negative evil force in the world, you have to be holier than them. You have to put on the breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, belt of truth, shoes of the gospel of peace, the, the elements of the Kohen Gadol in the spiritual world, or the, or the Kohen, not the Kohen Gadol, that's probably above our pay grade, but um, these, these elements of like the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, all of that has real practical every single day application, and that's through the mitzvot. So if all of Israel were, let's say all of the Jewish people today turned to the Torah and immediately nationally, nationally repented, maybe from Netanyahu, Netanyahu comes out, he's wearing sackcloth and ashes, he tells all of his people, we're, uh, we're all going to repent and cry out to Hashem for salvation, redemption would come immediately. Redemption would come instantaneously. And the captives would be released. Captives would be released. Mashiach would come. Temple would be rebuilt. The Isaiah 60, harmony with the, with the Islamic world, they would come and they would, they would honor the Jewish people. The Christians would grab a hold. Everybody would grab a hold of the seat seat of the Jewish person and say, come, let us go with you, for we are God is with you on a national, worldwide uh, level. Um, you would see all of this. Unfortunately, like everything else in every culture, everyone's so divided. Even though Israel is is pretty much politically, I would say maybe like at this moment, maybe, I don't know, 85% on the same page at this moment due to the attack, spiritually, not everybody's on the same page. And this goes something for all of us too, especially as believers, because we can't really point a finger at anybody else. We have to point a finger at us first is how unified are we? What about our own righteousness? What about our own application of faith and, and, and mitzvot and works? And, and so it begins with us. Before messianics, before believers tell the Jewish people anything, they need to straighten their own house out. And if that were, to, if that were the case, um, we'd be a lot closer to redemption. But long story, when somebody does a spiritual mitzvah, doesn't matter what religion they are. This is going to kind of, it's kind of mind-boggling statement. If somebody does a spiritual does a mitzvah in the world, it doesn't matter what they believe, whatever. They could be an atheist, right. and they give to a they give to a a poor person. They, the laws of metaphysics still apply. All right, so right. gravity is still gravity, even if it's gravity. It doesn't matter. Right. 
And so, um, I mean, it matters, but it still has application. It still has effect. So for Israel to neutralize all these forces against it, it must grab onto the Torah, grab onto Hashem, grab on to redemption like never before. Um, through righteousness, teshuva, tefillah, and tzedakah. With that said, how are these spiritual locusts not attacking the people? Because they have the seal of truth of, uh, on their heads. They have the seal of Hashem on their heads. So if you were a breastplate of righteousness, then their breastplates of iron that we're about to read about in verse 9 are neutralized. So Revelation 9, they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and their sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots or of many horses rushing to war. That would be the blades of a helicopter. <coughs> Could be, could be. Um, the sound of their wings. I mean, it sounds like you could, you could argue this is airplanes, this is tanks, this is everything. What if it's like Horton hears a who, and they're microscopic? They're my. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just the rushing sound in your ear. Oh. Have you seen the AI where they? It's all synced into one. Like do different designs, like at the Olympics and stuff. Mm. Drone, swarms. Yeah. drone swarms. Yeah, I have seen that. That's kind of creepy. Could it be that something like that? Drones. Drones. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, drone their swarms. military drones are the next level of. Yeah. Okay. So these breastplates, they have breastplates of iron, sound of the rings with the sound of chariots. That sounds, could sound like a helicopter, could sound like an airplane, could sound like a drone. Listen to this. The strongest echo from the Tanakh comes from Jeremiah 46, which portrays the coming judgment on Egypt. The army of horsemen from the north are like serpents, innumerable locusts wearing breastplates, uh, Jeremiah 46, verse 4, standing by the Euphrates River. Okay, that's in Jeremiah 46. That's going to be very significant for this chapter, and also later on, I believe, in chapter 16, which we're going to talk about. So um, you see that everything Revelation is saying can be found already in the Tanakh somewhere. And then when we, we unlock that, who is that that comes from the north? Now, in the ancient times, this is, you know, I, I guess you would say Babylon is coming from the east, but it comes from the north. Assyria comes from the north. Um, we already talked about this. The, the, when we reach that global scale, you go to Jerusalem, Go to the furthest north, you'll go. You'll intersect into Moscow. So, it does appear that a lot of this is is Russian, uh, is is coming from Russia. Uh, now, is it this particular text? Is this the Ezekiel thirty seven thirty eight uh, passage? I'm not clear that it is, um, but let's continue. They have tails like those of scorpions and stings. In their tails, they have the power to harm men for five months. Uh, still, that that specific time frame is kind of baffling. And the, the best thing we could say was that there was that curse of the rain during that time. Here's what I think. Sometimes prophecy is inherently cryptic. And only after the event happens can you look back and go, oh, man, how could I have missed that? I think once we pass this particular time we'll say okay this is obvious that this was it because it happened only for five months now whether this is some kind of um i mean I, I don't know exactly what this could be if somebody's some a venom that basically affects somebody whether physiologically immune immunologically or whatever i'm not sure okay if i knew i'd tell you Revelation 9.11, and they have over them as king the angel of the abyss. In he, his name in Hebrew is Avadon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. Okay, so I looked all over rabbinic literature to find an angel named Avadon. And I think I got something. All right, because most people say there is no angel named Avadon. And you would look and you, you see that... Uh, not specifically, but there is a passage, and I believe it's in Job, when it says death and Avadon, uh, they're personified. These two. Avadon, which means destruction, and death. And both of them are personified in the book of, of, of uh, Job. Now listen to this. Wait, what does Avadon mean? Avadon means destruction. All right, so check this out. 
you know, there was a text called Kava Yashar, which means the straight line uh, or the upright line there. Uh, it says, speaks about the king of Sodom in Genesis chapter 14. I think it's Genesis chapter 14, Genesis 15. The king of Sodom, remember when Abraham goes and he rescues Lot, and it's the war of the nine kings, five kings versus four kings, and there was Birsha, Amraphel, uh, there was all these different kings, and one of them was the king of Sodom. And the king of Sodom comes to Abraham, and he says, let me have the people, and you can keep all the things. But in Hebrew, it says, give me the souls. And basically, this king of Sodom represents something on a, on a deeper level. The rabbis say in Kabbalah Yashar that the king of Sodom is the prince of Gehenom. He's the one who says, give me the souls. It says that in Genesis uh the Genesis 15, I believe, is it? Um, let me see. I'm Raphael. I'll just get my Bible here. Mm-hmm. So Genesis 15. And this war is the first war, uh, the first world war. So this would be the first war of Gog and Magog in Genesis chapter 15. I think it's 15. No, it's 14. I'm sorry. So it's Genesis 14, and it says, It came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, which is Iraq, Arioach, the king of Elisar, Kedar Laomer, the king of Elam, which as I understand it is modern-day Iran, Tidal, the king of Goyim, the king of the nations. They made a war with Bera, the king of Sidom, Birsha, the king of Gomorrah, Shinab, the king of Adma, and Shemeber, the king of Zevoaim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. So you see that all these nations are fighting each other. Anytime you see a multinational war, it is a war of Gog and Magog. The gamatria of Gog and Magog is 70. So a multinational war. We talked about a couple of weeks ago with Rabbi Elchanan Wasserman says the war of Gog and, Gog and Magog will be threefold, World War I, World War II, and then a final war. So this would be World War Zero. And if you look into this, you will see that they turned in this battle. They came to En Mishpat, which, um, if I understand correctly, is this place of judgment, the well of judgment. And they fell into these pits made of tar. And in, in the midst of this battle, Abraham wins. The rabbis look at this and they say, when you see the nations, when you see the powers fighting each other, expect the footsteps of Messiah based on this verse. So we know the principle, siman lebanim, that which is the fathers do is a, a portent, a picture of, the, of what, the, what is gonna, the, the children are going to experience. So it says, and then they went and they struck the, the, the land of the Amalekites in verse 7. Then they turned and they came back to Ain Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and they conquered all the country of Malachites. The Amalekites didn't even exist yet. Okay, they did not even exist. Am- Amalek is the son of 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 Esau, son's uh, El- son Eliphaz with a lady named Temna. So the rabbis say, how on earth is this possible that we have in this anachronistic opinion here or this name, the Amalekites? The Amalekites didn't even exist. And the rabbis say, God tells the end from the beginning. In other words, this picture right here is a picture of the final world war, which is going to involve all the nations, Iran, uh, Iraq, um, all these different areas. And they, they basically pinpoint right to the T. So, um, and then it says at the end that uh, it says Saddam, uh, the king of Saddam came and he says, or does he says they fled the, all the kings they fled and they fell into these tar pits which is a picture of them being judged in the final days and the king comes the king of Saddam went out to meet Abraham at the valley of Shaveh that is the king's valley and Melchizedek the king of Shalem brought out the bread and wine it's very interesting Melchizedek is a picture of Mashiach and we know that from 11q Melchizedek uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls and then we have this guy Saddam And he tells, the king of Saddam said to Avram, give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. But he doesn't say that. In Hebrew, he says, Vayomer Melech Saddam el Avram, ten li hanefesh, give me the souls. 
Give me the soul. He wants the soul. So this king is represented by this, by this where we are reading about this king of Gehenna. And that's in Kavaj Yashar. Okay. Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi said, Gehenna has seven names, and they are as follows. Sheol, Avadon, Be'er Shachat, Bor Sha'on, Tita Yavin, Tzalmavet, and Eretz Tachtit. So Tzalmavet means the shadow of death. That's one of the names for hell. Eretz Tachtit, I think, is a dry, thirsty land. Avadon is the place of destruction. I was also reading... And, and there's the text here manifold in Judaism. Like you can find anybody that goes to Sheol, it's possible they could come back out. But anybody that goes to Avadon, they're just, they're, it's gone. They can't go any further. So Keener says, Avadon is a Hebrew name for the lowest depths of the earth, the realm of the dead, Job 31, 12, Psalm 88, 11, Proverbs 27, 20. The Dead Sea Scrolls also linked the spirit of Avadon with the angel of the pit. Uh, which I find to be interesting. Okay, Revelation 9.12. The first woe is past, and behold, there are still two woes coming after this. One way that, that when the tribulation hits, according to the rabbis, you'll know it's the tribulation, is because the hits just keep coming. They don't, there's no pause, there's no break. So well, they, that's like transition when you're giving childbirth. Yeah. Okay. But it's it's constant. So they just they just they escalate, just escalate. Yeah. They just they, don't stop. Not, not so it's just one disaster disaster after another. We have seen multiple disasters even back to back in our world, but we've had, pause. we've had pauses, we've had breaks. Mm -hmm. There isn't a break in the last days. It just boom, 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 boom. I guess because the Hevle Mashiach, the contractions yeah. of the of the pregnancy is just like okay it's past the point of no return so uh one rabbi says many hardships and severe disasters birth burst forth again and again while the earlier one is still enacted the second one comes quickly like before the first one ends the second one already hits i thought in 2020 like we were looking around and like okay COVID breaks out, and then there was this massive California fire, and then there was, like, murder hornets. You know, it was like, like murder hornets. We got murder hornets. Okay. Mm -hmm. Revelation 9, 13. The sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the horns of the golden altar, which is before God. We discussed this last class. The golden altar is the altar of incense, which is in the holy place in the temple. Verse 14 saying to the sixth angel who had one shofar, free the four angels who were bound at the great river Euphrates. Okay. In Revelation 16, 12, we see that Euphrates will dry up, opening a way for the kings of the east. The Euphrates water level has been drying up in recent times. I don't know if you have seen that, mm -hmm. yeah. but there's like a whole preservation thing behind this and there's multiple reasons um, as to why this is but this happening is not it is like you see it happening gradually it appears it's going to dry up completely and then this army is going to pour over and Euphrates is the boundary of Israel as it's supposed to be so Israel's boundary is supposed to be the Euphrates which is, I means like the, the footprint supposed to be way bigger than what it is Okay. Um, in Euphrates, I think it goes through Iraq and it runs up through Jordan, I think. Okay. So Euphrates River is mentioned in Genesis 2, 4, 15, 18, Deuteronomy 1, 7, 11, 24, Joshua 1, 4, 2 Kings 20, 23. We could explore every one of these. It's in the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Every one of these particular passages all link to this. And we're going to explore the Euphrates River more in Revelation 16. But there are some angels who are bound at this particular place, and they apparently they were, they were prepared for this particular purpose. Now it says the four angels were freed who had been prepared for that hour and day and month and year so that they may kill one-third of mankind. Okay. 
So this is before the mark of the beast. I want you to think about that. The mark of the beast hasn't even come out yet. The Antichrist hasn't even come out yet. Um, we have seen massive things hit. I don't know whether it was a nuclear bomb already in last week's portion with the Chernobyl angle, if that turns out to be a nuclear bomb. We see that there's been wars. We see that there's been all kinds of things, and we haven't even got to the Antichrist yet. I think that this is what leads to the Antichrist. Yes. Did you know that one thing everybody's looking for is a savior? Mm -hmm. Everybody well, certainly will after all this happens. Yes. Even today, though, even before this happens, I heard somebody say that they're watching a Joe Rogan podcast, and uh, and the whole time he's talking, that he told me that Joe Rogan said this. Now I haven't seen it, but he's like, anytime you're looking for truth. You will always keep being pulled back to this Jesus person. Like, you will always keep being pulled back. To, this guy's not a religious person, Joe Rogan. But he's like, everybody's looking for something. They're look, and, and if you're looking for truth, you keep start, starting to look for the truth. You'll keep intersecting with this person, Jesus, what he says. And um, I think that's fascinating because we are looking. For, remember when Obama got elected? Everybody said, man. There were songs about Obama. He's going to save us. I heard people say, man, I'm so happy. This is the first time in my life. This is going to be the greatest thing. And then hope and change didn't go anywhere. And all everybody had left was a little hope and some change in their pockets. And, so, and, then, and then we swing way, America swings way to the other, other side, and we, and we get trouble. I'm not trying to make this political. I'm just saying that people are looking for someone to... He's save America. I mentioned this earlier in Trump we trust and that type of thing where I saw that big sign, which it cannot be. You cannot trust in any human politician whatsoever. You can only trust in Hashem. Um, with that said, we're going to swing back again and we go over here and we're going to swing back again over here. It's because people are looking for someone to to bring uh, bring the, the redemption. The human soul deep down is looking for someone to fix the problems that they see. And, and, and that's natural. It's also kind of lazy in a sense because it, it's, it's always easy to, to look for someone else to do it instead of us. Um, but collectively, we are looking for this redemption and no politician is going to provide for it. I don't care who they are. Okay. One third of mankind. I've heard an estimate and I hope this is wrong, and I truly don't know, that that means one-third of mankind who's existing by Revelation chapter 9. At this point, one opinion is that half the planet is already dead. Okay? This is shocking. If not, let's say everybody, 8 billion people are still on the planet. We're talking about 2 billion people dying here. 2 billion with a B. If not... That up to four billion has already passed away by Revelation nine. Okay, that should be a showstopper to make us think. Two billion people, first of all, with a B. What on earth are we talking about here? Everything that we've saw from the from economic in instability, a nuclear bomb, lack of water, contamination of water supplies. You have spiritual forces being unleashed on the earth. You have these terrible things hitting the earth. And as scary as all this sounds, I want to tell you the book of Revelation is a book of hope. It's a complete book of hope. Because no matter what we see in all of this, we know what is going to happen. We know who is going to win. We know the resurrection of the dead is going to, is going to happen. And no matter what we face in this world... It's not the end. This whole world is nothing but a, an antechamber. So, Revelation 9.16, we're going to get to this part, part now, Anthony. This is very interesting. The number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. So what was your, what was your comment on this? Because I actually noted this in the comments. Estimates for global population at the time are, are hard to nail down. But estimates are, they vary kind of broadly from 150 to 300 million people. Right. So 200 million people would land kind of in the middle-ish yep. of 
every living being on the face of the planet at the time that he said this. Okay, so just in case anybody didn't hear this, so I want to repeat what you said. You said estimates were 150 to 300 million total population at the time in like 90 AD. Of the globe. Of the yeah, globe, of the century, whole planet. The whole planet. So I had 190 to 250 million based on it's estimates. Really, There's people come up with different estimates. But we know broad. we know that the estimate is somewhat in the ballpark. Right. And the reason why, because the world population has exploded in these last generations. So so I want to tell you a couple things with that. There's been about 109 billion people live on planet Earth since the beginning. All right, that's the estimate of what I've read. 109 billion, uh, including the people that are alive today. Eight billion. Eight billion people. So I want to see. I want you to see this. So it goes like this. There was like 200 million people on the planet, and then all of a sudden, boom! We see this massive increase. Did you know the rabbis say that the Messiah will not come until all the souls in the goof are emptied? All right, so I want to tell you what that means. There is a heavenly holding tank. It's not the best way to say it, but goof literally means body. But there is a, I say a well of souls, maybe say it that way. When the well of souls called the goof is completely emptied in heaven, Mashiach will come when the final soul is born. Okay? Now I want you to just think about this mathematically what that means. 200 million, 200 million, 200 million. Boom! 8 billion. Mathematically, we're about to see the coming of Messiah just, just in terms of, of metrics. If you, if you do, if you know about Excel, you can do things called uh, trend lines. The trend line is this. It's just totally, you can see this in any uh, world population metric. So what that means is just by the numbers of people that are alive today, we're about to see the coming of Messiah. That number of people, though, also compounds any type of world, any type of disaster. So let's say that there was a pandemic of, I don't know, just some random pandemic 200 years ago. Well, 200 years ago, there was only one billion people on the planet, um, and they were all stuck in their own local, re regional, geographical places. We have airplanes. Okay, so if uh, I actually remember being at the hospital. Um, I had to man the door when we thought somebody with Ebola was coming. And Ebola is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty nasty. Pretty bad. So we had a certain route that they were going to take, and we knew exactly which room. And, and these people were out in the car. And before, I mean, just the, the protocols that we, we already had in place, man, I was, I was scared. I was like, oh, man, I'm kind of a germaphobe anyways. I was like, this is not just any germ. This is Ebola. And it didn't turn out to be Ebola. But um, the deal with Ebola, it burns itself out too quick. But there are, there are laboratories. Uh, the Wuhan Institute of Virology is still running and all these things. Man, this is now anything that we do in this one side of the world will spread over the entire globe within months. Okay? The bubonic plague has hit back. It's come back. Yeah, there's all kinds of in different. In Mexico, there's people, a person died from the good one. Oh, boy. Ooh. So. Well, and the crazy thing is they're trying to make all these infectious diseases worse. Right. Like yeah. Function Gain of function yeah. research. Here, let's see if we can make this worse. Let's make it 10 times worse. <clears throat> yeah. Why that's terrible. We, that's, that should be banned. Yeah. Oh, 100%. And in the, and the U.S. government has funded that stuff. That's, that's completely bonkers. Okay. 200 million. Any biblical commentary <clears throat> that you see on this, almost everybody will say, this is not literal. <coughs> it's a, there's no way that you could have 200 million people. That, this, is, this is, I even heard one pastor say, this is why we don't believe this is literal, because th this would be just astronomical in terms of an army. Like nobody would be, no army is this big. So I started pulling some data. So the U United States Army of active members is 1.4 million people. Russia's is 1.3 active. They claim to have 150 total million, 150 million total. Uh, China has 2 million active. That doesn't mean necessarily they couldn't muster it. And India has 1.4 million. And there's some, other, um, there's some other metrics here. But I want you to think about this just for a moment. 
John says, I heard their number. Whenever somebody says, oh, the Bible can't be serious on this one, every single time that's ever happened, the Bible always comes out on top. When, it said, when skeptics said that King David didn't exist, and then they find like the Mesha stale or whatever that has Beit David, you can clearly read it in the, in the paleo, ancient, uh, whatever it is, Canaanite script. Yeah, you can clearly see it says House of David. You have so many archaeological discoveries that have confirmed the proof of the Bible. We now live in a world that could muster this. It's possible to do this, which is shocking. And I think it also underscores the veracity of the New Testament and gives it evidence. Because if this were truly every single human being on earth coming up to fight against Israel at the time of the night, even when John wrote this, he probably wrote it goes, I heard their number. That can't be right. Uh, do you really want me to say this? 200? Are you sure 200? Not 200,000? Are you sure 200 million? We now live where this can happen. Can you imagine the foresight that he would have had to have or the prophecy that he would have had to have for that to be, that, that to be true? Moreover. What's the Hebrew word for million over here? Uh, well, in, in, in Greek, it's dio mi, mirius mirius, which literally means 200,000 thousand. So that means thousand times thousand and a million two hundred. So something else. Every commentator is saying this is only one army. Okay, I don't. I, this doesn't have to be only one army. It says kings. What does it say? Uh, they come across the river Euphrates. They come across the river Euphrates, and it says that, that the of armies of the horsemen. That this is plural. And the kings is plural. Um, now, that means that there are multiple nations involved in this. 200 million is completely plausible, but it was not plausible in the first century. Today it is plausible. So I find that to be quite remarkable, and it actually gives evidence for the veracity of the prophecy of the New Testament, because the New Testament is pro prophesying something that would have been literally impossible at the time it was written. Nobody in their right mind would have written that based on the world population, which you said, and yet here we are in a world population at the end of time that could totally fulfill this prophecy to the T, and he said, I heard their number. In other words, I don't think that this is just symbolic. Could it be symbolic? I guess it could, but I doubt it. Well, that, like several different armies have multiple millions of people, but that's active right now. That's right. Not reservists. Not reservists. Right. And if they instituted a draft, that's right. If they drafted their military age men, you could easily have to. And a world cataclysmic event could totally trigger tons of people joining the army, maybe even just to get fed, who knows. Uh, well, that's entirely possible. So you see what Revelation is talking about here accords with the current metrics of the world population and geopolitical alignments. Uh, Maybe it's just a coincidence? I don't think so. Okay, Revelation 9, 17. I saw the horses in the vision and those who sat on them having breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue and sulfur yellow, and the heads of lions out of their mouths proceed fire, smoke, and sulfur. Um... I guess you could say that this does, could very well possibly be like a tank, you know, shooting things out of the, out of the end. I'm going to comment on somebody that says that's, that's a misreading, but fiery red. Whose flag is fiery red? China. China. Hyacinth blue. Um, you know, Russia's is red, blue, and white. Yeah, most, and so I'm, uh, I'm looking. I'm not saying these are the flags, but I'm looking at this like, okay. Isn't Greece blue? Yeah, Greece is blue. I don't see them being a threat, though. I mean, I guess they could be, but. Um, what's, what's, what's Turkey? Turkey is. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not saying these are the flags, but it does appear like their armor is probably reflecting their national national heritage and so when it says red man I, is Sweden blue? 
I don't see the Swiss doing anything other than making cheese. Um, if there's somebody in Switzerland, I, I apologize. I didn't say Switzerland. Oh, Swiss. Oh, Sweden. Oh, the Swedes. Isn't that blue with a yellow cross? Yeah. I'm not exactly sure it's a flag, but long story, it appears to me that these are different nations, possibly three different nations. I don't know exactly. Um, could be multiple nations with similar flags, but they're coming across the Euphrates. So what does that tell you? Whoever it is, is on the east side of the Euphrates. And so blue that pretty much, what's that? Blue hats. You know where the blue hats are. I don't know who they are. The UN. Oh, yeah, the, the, those guys are, yeah, the UN's flag is blue. Yeah. 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 Oh, oh man, on I forgot about that. Do you think this is the Euphrates River? If it's the ancient Israel borderline, then it feels weird why they would be following that borderline. Well, it seems they're crossing over to come to come to the land, okay. so they're coming from the east. So you know, whoever it is, it's got to be on that side. So we're talking Iraq, Iran. I hate to say India, possibly, uh, hopefully not, but who knows. Or maybe there's a large group of Indians that don't like, because uh, India is not one group. There are multiple different groups. Gujarati, you have the Tamil, you have Hindi, you have various different groups. So it could be, could be. Um, and then uh, Mongolia, which hopefully Mongolia's, uh, Mongolians will, you know, I don't know. I don't know anything about Mongolia, but uh, China. You know, so you see that Russia coming from the north, China come from the east, and these guys are coming down, um, and it's not looking good. All right. So Revelation 9, 8, by these three plagues were one third of the mankind killed by the fire, by the smoke, and the sulfur, which proceeded out of their mouths. They're all nuclear, too. Uh, yeah, they are nuclear. Oh, Pakistan, I left out Pakistan. Afghanistan, too. All right, so the tribulation is probably limited to a third of the land above all because the influence of Ezekiel 5.2 that talks about one-third of the land. You see that in Zechariah as well. Um, these are all echoing Sodom and Gomorrah. So you see the Sodom and Gomorrah level, but it's on a global scale. Revelation 9.19, For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they, they harm. That is really cryptic and very unusual. So this could be something completely spiritual. It's totally possible that we're deal dealing with some kind of chimeric spiritual being, not unlike you know some of the other things we've seen on a demonic level. But you could easily see how this could, you could apply this to a tank, a helicopter, different types of war machines. Um, now, G.K. Beale, who is a genius, he says, the attempt to find the dominant model for the locust in modern warfare instead of Tanakh imagery is hermeneutically misguided. Okay? Um, I'm not so sure that I agree with this assessment, although I don't know and I don't claim to know exactly what this means. But I want to tell everybody a principle. Deborah Torah Kelashom B'nai Adam. The Torah speaks in the language of man. One classic argument is that when you're talking with, you know, you're, the, the fire shoots out of the mouth, that you could be, that the, the prophet is seeing a, a modern war machine and is describing it using the elements of his own culture, okay? Which could be completely legit. That's a possibility. We obviously have to do what Keener says by look for that symbolism and imagery in the Tanakh, look at the rabbinic commentary and apply it but we also need to know that when it says Hashem will carry the exiles to Israel on wings of eagles yes that can mean literal eagles but it can also mean completely legit airplanes it is okay to do that based on the principle Debra Torah Adam. the Torah speaks in the language of man so Keener then, uh, Craig Keener says, it may be of interest that the Parthians, who also apparently had long hair, like women, had become famous for their rearward archery. So the Romans would be chasing them on horses, and the Parthians would turn around and, and, and hit them with an arrow, and they weren't expecting that, because who has that skill to do, shoot a backwards arrow? So in any case, you see that there are different types of I mean, I don't know that much about modern tanks and stuff, but you have this one 
tank and then you could obviously shoot i don't know if you could shoot out of the top or or what but I don't see it to be a, a terrible argument to say that this entire horde and the and the whole imagery here cannot apply to a modern army rolling in with tanks, helicopters, drones, and all kinds of things. I don't see how that how that would not apply without denying that we're dealing with the spiritual force as well. Um, anybody have a comment or an argument on that? Uh, I think it sounds legit. It's, it could be a little ta uh, Hal Lindsay-ish, but I, based on what I know, it, uh, nothing precludes that or excludes well, where it. Would our modern, where would our modern method of operation go if this isn't modern warfare? Yeah, we're not going to be riding on horses to come fight somebody. We're not going to line up and... Are there that many horses in the world? I don't know, but that's not how the warfare is going to be, right? So it does appear to me that this is describing modern warfare, but also spiritual warfare. But that's something I think is very important that you said, that the miracles that happened to Israel in 47 and 48 and 67 and, and other times is, is very important to understand that there were times that, you know, my dad tells a, a joke, how do you tell an Arab tank from, a, from an Israeli tank? Well, Arab tanks have backup lights because they back up because the, the history here is that they're pulling up and all the Arabs turn around and, and ran. They said, well, why did you guys run? There's only like a thousand of them up there. A thousand? There was 10,000 of them up there. There were millions of them coming over the hills. And, and there was uh, reports of sightings of angels and different things. So when a physical war breaks out on earth, know that there's a spiritual war in heaven. And you can't truly beat a nation until you neutralize neutralize the prince over that nation with that nation's righteousness, why, which is why America totally, we beat the Nazis, but America was like comparatively today, I'm not saying it was perfect, but it, it morally... It was on a whole nother plane than where it is today. My the president would call for people to fast and pray. Yeah, my uh, my neighbor who passed away in in 103. You got to meet him, didn't you? Yeah. So his name was Mr. Bill. He's like he helped liberate a Holocaust camp, and this guy he's out 103 years old. He's out he's out raking his lawn. 102. I'm going, man, this guy's amazing. Um, so okay. Oh, I, I can imagine that at the time of the Holocaust, there had never been more prayer, especially in the. It's 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 mind-boggling. But they call that the greatest generation for a reason. You know, they those guys they're just made out of steel, made out of a different different material. They had come through the depression too. Come through the depression. These guys are made of steel, and there's a saying that hard times. Create. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mangle the saying, but hard times create tough men. Tough men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. And that's where we're at. Okay, Revelation 9.20. And the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they wouldn't worship demons, the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. That is critical. We have a ton of idolatry in the world today. We have idolatry in the West. We have idolatry in the East. People are worshiping statues of Jesus. People are worshiping statues of Mary. People are worshiping statues of various Hindu gods. And, and, and they're all demons. All of these things are demons. None of the... And these statues, the statues should worship, like, if I create a statue, that statue should worship me because I created it. I shouldn't worship it. It's made out of wood, made out of stone. And then there are statues of Buddha and different things. And what, I little, what little I know about Siddhartha Gautama is that this guy, was, he was fasting as part of the Eightfold Path. This, the idea of that real, you know, the fat Buddha type thing is a complete misrepresentation of him. But with that said, Worshipping statues is forbidden for every single Jewish person and non-Jewish person on planet Earth. Um, I don't care if it's a statue of Jesus, a statue of 
whatever it is. You cannot worship statues. But it says they continue to do that. But the idols go beyond statues. It goes into our, you know, our heroes of, you know, the the singers, the actors, the the whatever it is. Anything that takes Hashem's place in our life is an idol. And it goes beyond just a physical statue. This, um, but notice that it says they still did not repent. This right here. Someone wrote us in on, on after the revelation, one of the revelation studies said, where does it say in the Bible that, that prophecies, negative prophecies are conditional? Essentially, that was the question. It's right here. Right here proves that negative prophecies are completely conditional. Not completely, unless it's accompanied with a sign. But negative prophecies that something is going to happen is conditional upon repentance. Just like Jonah. Jonah goes in and says the, the entire Nineveh is going to be overthrown in 40 days. The king and everybody down, they say, okay, we need to put on sackcloth and ashes, even throw it on the animals. We're going to start repenting. And that repentance changed the evil of the decree. The prophecies, the negative prophecies in Revelation do not have to occur. This is very critical to understand. The nukes, the locusts, the wars, the hatred, nothing has to occur. Messiah can come without all of these things happening. It is totally theoretically possible for this to happen. <clears throat> is it going to happen? No. All of these things written in the Bible are going to happen to the T. Is, are people going to repent? We already know they're not going to repent. But this foreknowledge, this for this forward thinking pro or forward looking prophecy does not influence somebody's personal choice <clears throat> which goes into the biggest um which goes into the biggest uh divide one of the biggest divides in christianity calvinism versus armenianism a once saved always saved or you can lose your salvation I tell, I've told this story, so I apologize to everybody at Beat the Derrick uh, if you've heard it 10,000 times. But I was in Mardell, and I found a book that said, Why I'm Not a Calvinist. And it was like 227 pages long. Right next to the book made by the same publisher, it says, Why I'm Not an Armenian. And it's like 225 pages long or something. Apparently, this guy only needed two pages less than the other guy to argue his point. But when you see these two things come up, this is a question. Everybody, is it once saved, always saved, or can you lose your salvation? The rabbi solved it in one sentence in Pirkei Avot. Everything is foreseen, and yet free choice is given. You think, how can that be? Because if you see everything, then how do I truly have a choice? I'm on a destiny, a path that cannot be moved. And yet, well, on the same level, I still have choice. That's a contradiction. The Jewish mind can fuse contradictions together that the Gentile mind cannot do. The Gentile mind can, but you have to elevate beyond the Greek mind into the Hebrew mind. You have to elevate beyond the, the level of understanding. You have to go into higher dimensional worlds. So if I draw a picture, let's say I draw a two-dimensional guy on a piece of paper, and I draw a box around him, he's stuck, he can't go anywhere, right? If I breathe life into this little guy, he can go left, he can go right, he can go side to side but he can't go up if i were to reach into his world he would see like an mri slice of every one of my fingers just like these five circles just appear out of nowhere and disappear but if he lived on a higher dimensional world he could easily jump over that over that limitation in other words there are things in our lower dimensional world that seem like a contradiction foresight everything is foreseen and free choice is given but when you live in a higher dimensional world this is not a contradiction Okay, the rabbis take these two positions and just fuse them together based on the principle of elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chaim. These and these are the words of the living God. So this book that cost 225 pages, 227 pages, the rabbi solved it in one sentence. Everything is foreseen and free choice is given. And it's a matter of perspective. If I go through a door and it says, whosoever will may come, and I go through the door and I turn around and I see the sign on the other side, it says, chosen from the foundation of the world. It's a matter of perspective. It's a higher dimensional, uh, like a helicoidal way of thinking instead of like a linear Greek thought. Long story. When we see this, we see that if the world repented right now with Israel beginning, Israel has to be the leader. All right? If Israel doesn't repent, the world won't repent. So if Israel is the leader, 
they will totally evangelize the nations like two seconds. There's nothing more than a non-Jewish person wants deep down in their soul is to be taught the Torah by a Jewish person. Okay? And same thing for a Jewish person. It's like in their, in their being, they're supposed to share the Torah in the world. But because we've erected these walls of Berlin in our own generation, you have to remain in this box, you have to remain in this box, these things must be separate, you cannot mix the two, it is blocking the redemption. So long story, when we, uh, when we look at this, we just need to know, everything is dependent upon repentance, prayer, and charity. These three things. Teshuvah, tzedakah, and tefillah, which I think we talked about last week too. Listen to this. This is Beal. He's citing Josephus, Antiquities 2.14.1. 2, uh, 2, he says, One reason for the recounting of the Exodus plagues is to warn humankind in general that when they offend God as the Egyptians did, they will be punished in the same way. Why were the Egyptians punished? Because they didn't let the Jewish people go. What's happening in our own generation? We have 130 plus hostages and the whole place is being destroyed, and they still are refusing to let the Jewish people go. Um, more pointedly, Philo in the life of Moses says that one purpose of the plagues was to bring the Egyptians to their senses and, and subsequently notes that they were converted and brought to a wiser mind. This is the most beautiful thing. This is what's so shocking is that all the judgments are hitting the world, not because God hates the world and God is just like slamming the world. It's because God wants the world to repent. That's why the people weren't dying as they were going through the suffering for five months. So they'll call out to Hashem for mercy. They'll call out to him for salvation. They'll call out to him for healing. That is so merciful of God to say, man, I just, I'm not going to wipe this person out. I'm trying to get their attention. All these things are happening in the world for the sole purpose of getting the attention of the nations to come to the saving knowledge through Yeshua, to know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to leave the life of death. That is so incredible. So to, know, unfortunately, even I mean, in the experiences I've had, that's the last thought that anyone comes to, even among a God-fearing population, is that these people... They wouldn't repent, they're just a bunch of sinners. Yeah. You know, they long to die. Well, they need to just die. And even even among believers, that's kind of the, the thought process. Um, it, it's kind of disheartening a little bit that we're not more pro, you know, salvation, I guess. Yeah, uh, we need to be. Pro forgiveness. Pro forgiveness, pro yeah. salvation, yeah. pro... Pro forgiveness yeah. because the, we, we learned... Um, well, Yeshua said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they, they're doing. Uh -huh. And our prayer needs to be, Father, we ask that you show them the light and turn them to you and let them yeah. see the foolishness. But also, Father, we ask for your mercy and don't hold these sins against them. Give them mercy. That's that. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah, as we return back to that theme, that tells us that we need to be in the role of Abraham interceding for the world. Instead of just saying, Lord, judge them. Lord, should we call fire down on them and just burn them up? Uh, like the disciples said, like Elijah actually did that. Twice he did it. But um, listen to this. Legends of the Jews, chapter 4 by Ginsburg. Listen to this. Moses saw how the sinners, this, so Moses gets this heavenly tour and he's going into heaven and hell and seeing all the spiritual worlds in this text so moses saw how the sinners were burnt one half of their bodies being immersed in fire and the other half in snow while worms bred in their own flesh crawled over them and the angels of destructions beat beat them incessantly now i don't have the hebrew here but i believe destruction should be avadon abaddon nasargiel explained this is apparently an angel these are the sinners who committed incest, murder, and idolatry, who cursed their parents and their teachers, and who, like Nimrod and others, called themselves gods. All right? So this, I'm commenting on Revelation 9.21 as we're coming towards the end. They did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their sexual morality, nor of their, of their thefts. So Nimrod apparently called himself God, which is quite interesting, Nimrod being one of the first antichrists. In this place, which is called Abaddon, Avadon, he saw that the sinners were taking snow by stealth and putting it in their armpits to relieve the, plain, the pain inflicted by the scorching fire. And Moses was convinced that the saying was true. 
The wicked mend not their ways even at the gate of hell. All right, it's a very shocking text here. And it, I think it's directly relevant to what we've been reading this entire time, this Jewish background of this place called Avadon, destruction, and the angels of Avadon and this concept. And you see this in, jo- in Joel, this concept of repentance of return, and you see it in Revelation chapter 9, the whole reason that all of the plagues, all the four horsemen, all the trumpets, all the bulls, all these things, was not to just punish the people willy-nilly, was to wake them up, to get them to turn back to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as it says in the Tochecha, as it says in the rebuke in the Torah, it says God will pursue us to the ends of the earth, and he's pursuing the whole world because he loves the world. He's trying to wake the world up because the, the his merciful um patience by not judging and not slamming people are not repenting after hearing the word of god and so now he has to up the ante and up the ante and up the ante just as he did with pharaoh in egypt and this is happening on a global scale and we'll close with this joel 2 which is the as again undergirds all of revelation 9 hashem says yet even now turn to me with all of your heart and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. Tear your heart and not your garments, and turn to Hashem your God, for He is gracious and merciful, and slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, and He relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave a blessing behind Him, even a meal offering and a drink offering to Hashem your God. In other words, even the locusts won't destroy the crops to the point that you can even make an offering from the grain. And I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the great locust, the grasshopper, and the caterpillar, my great army which I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat and be satisfied and praise the name of Hashem your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people will never again be disappointed. You will know that I am among Israel and that I am Hashem your God and there is no one else. And my people will never again be disappointed. That is the, is the final thing is about us turning back, God will restore everything if we simply repent. Teshuvah, Tzataka, and Tefillah. It's in Revelation chapter 9. Stop our idolatries, stop our sins, stop our immoralities, and turn back to the God. Rend our hearts, not our garments, and he will receive us and restore everything that has been lost. So with that, we'll... You have a comment. I was going to say, I was thinking about it for a lot of times that we kept talking about how kind of awful the picture is, you know, yeah. and how bleak it is, yet, like, don't get lost in that type thing. Yeah. Um, but in Ezekiel 38, Bottle of Gog and my God, which yeah. with this, right, the closing verse after describing this I mean, horrible scene is, so I will show my greatness and my holiness and make myself known in the eyes of many nations, then they will know that I am the Lord. And I remember, like, the first time I read through that with my mind, I was just like, this is amazing! Like, it was a complete, like, because it like you, you see the grace of God even in the middle of all of these things. Like yeah. his love for us. Like he is not what is it, not slow as in some consider slow, but rather he's patient wanting to all look over things. He wants all to come to repentance and, and that's why he's doing this on a global scale. Just like in Egypt, there were all the nations there. He judged the sun because people were worshiping the sun. He judged the frogs because people were judging uh, were worshiping the frogs. He judged the Nile because people were worshiping that. And he's doing the same thing because he wants people to know him, because he loves him. And he doesn't want them uh, dying and going to this place of Avadon, which is a completely real place, and it's not good. And anybody who goes to Avadon doesn't doesn't apparently come out according to Jewish tradition. And it's forever. And it's forever, um, you know, or at least Leolam Vayed, which means to the point where we can't see anymore. Um, but long story, God is so merciful, and even in these judgments, it's only because God is trying to bring the whole world back to Him. And he loves them. And the whole theme of Revelation 9, of Joel 2, Jeremiah 51, all of these things is to turn back to Hashem, who is the source of life. And to me, that gives me great hope. In the midst of all these horrifying locusts with teeth like lions and all these things, is that they have these breastplates and all these things. Breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, shield of faith, sword of the spirit. All of these things are real, and it's all it's our mitzvot. It's our righteousness that Mashiach has given us. It's the seal of truth on our foreheads, and may we have that seal. Bizakut Yeshua Mashiach. Okay, let's pray, and we'll close out Revelation chapter 9.
Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity to study Revelation 9. Lord, as we go into Revelation 10, Lord, may you give us wisdom, understanding, and knowledge as we unlock it this week, as we start studying, Lord, and, and prepare for our next week. Father, we pray, Lord, that we will be people of Kiruv, people who bring others, who, who not just preach and wag a finger at other people, but bring them to the knowledge of you by reflecting your Holy Son. Uh, who is so loving, so it, who reflects you, who is so, you are so loving, so patient, so kind. And may we do that for others, Lord. And may we be like Abraham, that he pray that we intercede for those who are around us, in our families, our friends, our co-workers, our city, our state, nation, and the entire world, and for all Israel, in the merit of Yeshua, the Messiah. Amen.